We are joined today by Neil Steinberg, longtime Chicago Sun-Times columnist. Neil, I like that setup back there with the books behind you. Oh, thank you. I got those from the Sun-Times. They were throwing them away. So. Yeah. They make for a nice backdrop. They do. I actually use them sometimes, but I guess you can do the same thing online. So they're just superfluous. But Well, I think I admire everybody's uh, books when I watch them on various cable channels. And I pause the TV sometimes to see if I, in fact, have uh, those same books, some of the biographies or histories. Do you have the Oxford time. English Dictionary set? Because I bet you don't. I, I could never actually justify buying the damn thing, but uh, I certainly could pick it up. Neil, I'm, I, it, it distresses me to know that people throw books, even nice bindings out in this day and age, honestly. Well, we change offices sometimes and there's no room for them. You know, it costs, I mean, I think that's one thing we're going to be learning post-COVID is it costs money to have all that space. And, uh, you know, especially newspapers, we tend to be a to the bone. If the choice is place to store the books or have a job, I'll take <laughs> the job. You know, that. Yeah. Well, speaking of which, I just want to broach the subject. The Sun Times seems to be relatively intact, and I'm very happy it is. Do you have any thoughts on what's happened to your colleagues at the Tribune, your brethren over there? There seems to be a lot of offices open here in the last six months. Yeah, it's very sad. Um, you know, we were competitors forever. And that's, you know, now my line is we're all cooking in the same pot. Uh, as I'm sure your listeners know, they were bought by Alden Capital which is basically on the theory that people will buy the Tribune no matter what's in it. And so they got rid of their, all their marquee columnists, you know, Eric Zorn, Mary Schmeek, John Cass, Steve Goodman. And uh, to me, it is, it's a tremendous void in, in the history of the city and in the intellectual life of Chicago. Um, but they think that people, I mean, I, I hear almost every day from readers who've moved over to the Sun-Times um, and while I like to have them, it's like winning a race and then turning and seeing that your opponent is, you know, face down in the cinders 30 yards back. I mean, you don't want to win that way. Um, I'm good friends, at least with Eric Zorn. And so I, I worry for him, like, what's he going to do? You know, he's 63 and uh, still many good years left. I'm encouraging him to write a book, good to do something. And, you know, look, he's got a year salary so he can, uh, you know, if, if you're in the understanding stuff and meaning stuff uh, business, you, you don't like to see what's happened there. Well, content will win. I suspect somebody of Eric's talents or John Cass, or you mentioned uh, Steve Goodman. I think that was a, a Freudian slip. You meant yeah. Steve Chapman. I'm no longer with us. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm used to editing what I, what I uh, express, John. So the, the lack of an editor, uh, you might see that. I might, you know, say, uh, uh, Santa Claus when I mean Santa Clara. So thank you for catching that. Well, what I mean though, is the guys who have talent, the content is king and it'll find a way to get out there. That being said, I, it has been a number of years. The only reason I buy the Sun Times is for you and Mark Brown and other columnists. Uh, I enjoy Tellender and Morrissey, uh, at the Tribune. We already mentioned the columnists, you know, nobody really needs a newspaper for breaking news anymore. No offense. You buy it for the feature writers. And so, it's just what format are you going to place your material on or with in the future? I mean, uh, you know, for, first of all, thank you. But there's many other reasons. You know, Saturday, we have that wonderful sports rapper, which yep. is like Sports Illustrated, frankly, yep. the way it was. I mean, that you know, we, we've talked before, John, about the polarization of the country. And one thing that newspapers did wonderfully was to bring you all sorts of opinions. You know, they're, 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 if you read a, any quality newspaper, they bring you people across the board. You know, you, you mentioned John Cass and I didn't correct you. You know, he certainly was there. And uh, I think that once you're online and you can set the system to only show you what you already believe, then we're going to be in more trouble than we already are, which I, is I a concur. lot. I concur. I was talking with a buddy of mine in the golf course uh, today, as a matter of fact, I said the most valuable teacher I ever had was my English lit, lit teacher. And every, he'd start every day by reading a column, either out of the Tribune, the Sun Times, uh, the Daily Herald, or one of the Detroit newspapers too. He subscribed to six or seven newspapers as I do to this day. But the columnists are always the most important people in the paper. Since you mentioned competition, am I right to remember that didn't you start a column 
were you essentially ghosted and rebutted Bob Green years ago? Um, I did something in the reader called Bob Watch. I don't know if I ghosted him. What I did was I understand I never met the man. Okay, so I was a younger person and I, I, I hated that nostalgic notion that, you know, love songs were prettier in 1964. And so what I would do is I would react to the column um, in sort of a cruel fashion. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I did it for two years. I wrote that and then I stopped. I just, I felt like I was beating a dead horse literally and uh, Cranes outed me as the author. Remember, I wasn't a columnist. And there's a rule in journalism that it's easier to apologize and get permission. And so I didn't want to walk into the editor's office and go, hi, you don't know me. I'm a night shift nobody. I'd like to write an, a column for the reader, OK? So I just did it. And I, I used my, my wife's maiden name was Edie Goldberg. And so I shortened it to Ed Gold. And that was my <laughs> pseudonym. And it, I, look. It's been 25 years, and the fact that people still mention something I did 25 years ago, I think, speaks to it. In this day and age, considering what we saw out of the governors, um, you know, the, the in Albany, New York, with Cuomo and other politicians and other celebrities, and uh, you know, in a very evolving society, and as far as uh, the Me Too movement, Bob Green, he seemed to be run out of town relatively quickly for would seem when you grade on a curve of 2021, not, not innocent behavior, but certainly we've seen far worse. Do you get well, the same sense? He had sex with a 17-year-old, John. I don't, that's criminal behavior. Well, uh, but I, thought, I, thought it was, I thought he met her when she was uh, interviewing him, but the affair didn't start until much later when she was an adult. I wasn't there with a stopwatch. And he actually he wasn't, it was years later. What he was fired for, just to remind people, was that she contacted him years later as part of whatever therapy a person has to go through to get beyond having had sex with Bob Green. And huh. when she did, he sicked the FBI on her. He turned mm. her into the FBI, some pal he had as that. And so and I think a newspaper can't have, when people complain about you, can't have you ratting them out to the feds. Uh, again, I, I don't, you know, that was unfortunate. I was I was writing, you know, it was a more lighthearted look at what he wrote. The fact that he was a a, a or into it. This was not news to the Tribune. Every once in a while, uh, what's her name? That Tribune executive who's now at Harvard will take like a victory lap, like they had done something wonderful. They 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 didn't. They turned a blind eye to it for years, and and so. You know, look, I feel bad about them. The man had talent at one point, but uh, it's way in the past. Neil Steinberg is here, longtime columnist for the Chicago Sun-Times. A profound book that made quite an impact on me was Drunkard, which was published in uh, 2008. I mentioned this to you a number of times on the air and off. But uh, I had been on a quite a, quite a binge for a weekend and was uh, disgusted with my behavior. And I, I had the book on my shelf and took it down and read it. And I thought it was just a very profound incredibly well-written book that I think about to this day. And it took you through that process. I've not yet read, and I need to, the follow-up or the sequel to that, Out of the Wreck I Rise. That's from 2016. And I think last time you were on the air, we were talking about how this book kind of grew out of your, correct me if I'm wrong, but your admiration or I guess you used it as a jumping off point, the great uh, literary writer and philosopher Samuel Johnson. Is that true? That is true. Um, you probably readers or listeners have probably heard of Boswell's life. It's one of the great biographies, one of the first great biographies. And, and uh, Boswell was a Scottish lawyer who sort of followed Johnson around uh, Georgian London in the 1770s, I guess. And uh, so Johnson is this very articulate man. He's, you know, all sorts of sayings that you, that you may not realize came from him. You know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions and patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel and on and on and on. Um, and he was also someone who struggled with uh, alcoholism before it was, there was a name to it. And so I was reading this book and there were all these wonderful thoughts about wine and, and drinking. If I could, uh, where, let me think, give an example. Uh, he turns down wine, which shocks his friends. And, and one of the friends says, you mean like if, if someone brings you to his cellar and wants you to drink something that's sat there for 20 years, you're gonna say no? 
And Johnson says, you know, you know, a man doesn't care what another man does. And once you've given up the great joy that comes from wine, any of the other considerations but a trifle. Huh. They were so helpful. And if you ever go to an AA meeting, you know, some of the, the big book stuff is so kind of 19th. 30s, black mask, trite. So it's, it's not the most artful stuff. And I thought, you know, people don't understand recovery. They, they don't understand addiction. Wouldn't it be great to explain it using quotes like this? Yeah. And so I basically walk people through the whole addiction and recovery process using lines from poems and songs and stories and things. And it was a labor of love. I mean, it took me five years. I wrote a co-author named Sarah Bader who helped me. And uh, I, I loved writing it, and it seems to help people. I mean, it wasn't the huge bestseller I would have liked. Uh, my wife had a wonderful line uh, when I was kind of, you know, you're writing a book, you hope it does well. And I was kind of using that maybe this will be the big breakthrough book. And my wife sort of arched an eyebrow, and she said, oh, you mean your book of poetry for <laughs> alcoholics? <laughs> I kind of realized that by the time you slice those two groups, people who are addicted and people who like poetry, although... I do, you know, the idea was to use poetry to help people with addictions, but I kind of also use addiction to get people into poetry. I mean, so you know, even if you don't necessarily, if you're lucky enough not to either know somebody or yourself having issues with this, and, and that's, there are not that many people, I don't think, but there are some really good poems and literature and lines in it. So I, you know, again, I, I uh, the way my books don't sell, John, I have to, my, my rule is I have to enjoy doing it. And I, I must say, I love, I love writing that book. Well, as I said before, I thought Drunkard was a profoundly well-written book. I loved it. And I Thank still you. reference it. Um, and then I'll, I want to read Out of the Wreck, I Rise. That's from uh, four or five years ago. Do you think the, pre you know, I, I was talking with Rick Kogan about this on the air the other day, another fine columnist on the Tribune side oh, yeah. of the world. And he used to uh, essentially act as Mike Royko's bodyguard downtown yes. uh, while Royko was uh, into his cups and very belligerent. And in reading the books about Royko having to produce five columns a week, and you still do three a week, doing five columns a week of 800 to 1,000 words, you know, the implication was that that kind of drove him to drink. That's not true, clearly. But uh, there is there's pressure on a columnist to come up with a premise, get it done, get it in on deadline, and then you're responsible for it as well. You know, I wonder if in, in reading your book, Drunkard, you would say almost trying to uh, walk in the footsteps of some of these great columnists and writers, hard drinking writers and columnists and poets. I like Dylan Thomas at the bar in Greenwich village uh, that contributed to kind of the romance of drinking in those days. Uh, absolutely. You know, I know I knew Royko and, you know, you were a newsman, you drank. It's sort of what you did. It was your job. Um, I mean, he's been dead almost 25 years now and he had a constitution of an ox. He should still be with us. And so, I mean, it is that whole romantic myth and it is, it's a myth, it's a lie. And, you know, you have to realize that there's, you know, this is how I explain it, John. When, when, you, when you get sober, uh, you're trading one thing, your addiction, the substance you love, heroin, booze, whatever, for everything else. And the addiction has so skewed your judgment, you're not sure that's a good trade. And so you give up one thing and you get everything else. And I don't think, you know, I've been sober 15, 15 years now and uh, coming up on 16 years. And, you know, I don't think my writing's worse. I don't think my life is worse. Nobody ever looks back and goes, boy, I wish I drank more in that period. Boy, I wish I got drunk last night. Nobody says that. And so I'm, you know, every once in a while, it used to happen more. It doesn't really happen too much anymore, but people would kind of try to throw that period in my face and, I'd say, you know, that getting sober is one of the greatest things I did. It was, it was, it's the biggest challenge. It was most, after that, everything's easy. You know, when, when you do get out of the wreck, I rise, the opening sentence is, it's the hardest thing you'll ever do, which is true. Is writing easier now for you? Um, I like it. I'm very lucky. I'm not like pounding, you know, it, the hard part is the idea. You know, I have to have, I have to write a column in the morning. And I literally have no idea what I'm going to write about. I can't write about dog poop because I already did three <laughs> <laughs> last week and three in a row. The fact that I could do three in a row, actually, I think it was three out of four on dog poop and have no one complain shows that I was able to, to go places with it. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't tell my bosses what I'm doing generally. They don't know till it shows up. They trust me. 
And so I have to give them something that can run on page two of the Sun-Times. And that's a tremendous responsibility and privilege that I try not to take lightly. I'm always thinking about it and, and, and trying to find that thing. Um, but there's always something. I've never not done it, you know, so I, I'm, I don't, I'm confident now. Um, I was uh, listening to some of your, your colleagues in their, you know, post-column era. I know it's early for a lot of them. But the one thing uh, to a man and a woman that I've heard about not being a columnist anymore is the fact they don't miss the online trolls. How do you deal with all the uh, vitriol sent your way? I ignore it. I try not to read it. I block people. And they write me 10 to 30 times a day, every day for years. Now, I could sit there and read them and try to extract meaning and think, or, or I could say, you know, I'm sorry this person has, is mentally ill, but I can't help them. I'm not, you know. And so I, I look at what people say and I try, to, especially in, the, in this era, I don't argue with people. If you haven't figured it out now, you're never going to. So I try not to let the poison in because, you know, you see words arranged on a page and they may, you know, I heard from someone yesterday who was reacting to some Fox News report from five years ago. You know, and what am I supposed to do? Have an, uh, actually, I did write him back because he, you know, uh, so sometimes I, it depends how I feel. But the bottom line is, is I'm trying to create, to maintain, remember Quest for Fire? Remember that scene with the bag with a little spark and they're in like a downpour and they're trying to keep, keep this little spark. So I'm trying to keep whatever little spark I have going. And if there's people who violently hate me and think I suck, how much attention should I give them, you know? I, 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 I try to give them enough that I can tell that people are thinking this way. But, you know, one of my, I don't have too many rules, but one is don't write for people who hate you. And it's a smart rule, smart rule to have. I, 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 I understand what you uh, go through on a, on a, on a certain level. You must get the same thing in listeners I do. and listeners and things. You know, I do it's, I get the same thing. There's a, there's a lot of hostility. There's a lot of people, that they're, they're just, I don't want to say they're bad people, they're damaged people and they want to, they're bullies and they want to go around and hurt people to try to feel better. And, you know, if I write them back, I'll say, keep moving. You know, you, 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 you may have found this, but you're not, you know. Do you miss uh, commuting downtown? A big part of, uh, you know, your work from time to time was referencing Metro and walking to and from the, uh, the Sun-Times building to the uh, station back and forth. Do you miss that? You think we're ever going to get back to that? I hope so. I mean, the times I've gone downtown, I've usually written about it. You know, I went down last week, just my wife and I took a day off, took the architecture cruise. Uh, when I, I was there Monday, uh, the opening of the Goodman, and to be on, you know, to eat at the Dearborn and go across the street and see Bob Falls turn on the marquee and then go see a play, come home, is fantastic. Uh, you know, the city's looking better. There's more people, you know, you, you when COVID first started, my big concern, I kept thinking that line from War One, you know, what'd you do in the war, daddy? I didn't want to be sitting on my ass in Northbrook, pardon me, while this whole thing was going on. So I tried to do a lot of stories at Mount Sinai and Roseland about doctors and nurses treating this and try to cover it best they can. And I, I look back and I feel, you know, on the other hand, you have to, to be who you are. And I'm not, I'm not on Lower Wacker Drive warming my hand over a 55 gallon drum trash fire. You know, I'm not, people aren't reading my column to get a bunch of like insidery news, you know? Um, so I, I like going downtown because you would find things. Things would happen. I like reading your columns, whether and, you're covering uh, politics or uh, uh, hot dog buns, which is the most recent one, I think. Yeah, and I did go downtown. I went to the Northwest side for that. See, that, that came for me that, that, you know, Heinz did some challenge of, Rosen's and Vienna, they didn't realize that they had already figured, they'd already coordinated the number of buns and the number of hot dogs years ago, but, but the, some publicist for uh, uh, S. Rosen's sent that to me, and I'm kind of the kind of guy, you, I, you, you put your hand out and I grab it and like take your elbow, and so once I had the S. Rosen's people, I said, well, no, I don't want to write about this BS thing from Heinz in Toronto, but I'd love to come to your plant. And I love factory tours. And you'd be amazed how you have to beg people. In fact, as soon as that came out on Monday, I sent that to Bayes because I did, I love English muffins and I love Bayes. And I had done a story on their packaging, which took me about three months to set up because they just couldn't get their heads around what I was trying to do. And I'm like, 
look at this thing with S. Rosens. It could be you guys. And again, on one side, it could seem sort of just weird commercial publicity. But you know, how much can you read about how we're going down the toilet as a nation? You know, yeah. I, I mean, when you write three times a week, you have to give variety. I know I, I don't want to read another, you know, expose about whatever. You know, you, you have to you have to try to enjoy life while you're alive as well. Um, That's good advice. That's a good place to uh, end this particular conversation. Neil Steinberg, thank you very much for your time. Much appreciated. I'll meet you at Myers Tavern, and is that in Northbrook? No, that's that's. Uh, no, no it, but it's it's not. It's on Lake Street. It's not far, and I, I still go there because they got good cheeseburgers, and yeah. I will meet you at Myers. Sometime. Rick Tallender and I sometimes meet there, and I, so I, it's a beautiful old grandfathered in place, and so yeah. uh, love to meet you at Myers one of these. Days. All right, I'll call Rick, and we'll we'll meet over there, and we'll we'll talk some more. But thanks so much for your time. We'll have you back on the Terrestrial Radio as soon as possible, and uh, Anytime, I'll, John. I'll read more in the uh, Chicago Sun Times. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Thank you, Neil.